Midlife is when you should get really clear on what matters to you and worry less about satisfying others and worry more about saying like, what, how can I get clear about what matters to me? What are my values? What is my purpose? Um, what means something to me? And that's part of what we help people with at MEA, at the Modern Elder Academy. And we also have online courses where we do that too. Um, so long story short, is, uh, that's another p key piece of it. Um, and another piece is like knowing what to let go of. Chip, you're very, very welcome to the Scalax Insider podcast. Delighted and thrilled to have you on the show today. Oh man, this is, uh, I, I like hanging out with Irish people. So I, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Brilliant, and we've just we've just found out you've got Irish roots, so we're going to get you over this side of the world at some stage in the near future to maybe do part two in person. So looking yeah, forward to that. Look, you know our vision is to inspire, connect, and enable millions of ambitious leaders of small and medium-sized enterprises to scale with purpose. So, Chip, what does scaling with purpose mean to you? You know, I, I've been lucky enough in my career with three different businesses that I've helped lead um, to sort of see what that means. I, I've always called it scale with soul. And um, so scale and purpose, there's some similarities, but scale with soul. And and when I was at Joie de Vivre, when I founded the second largest boutique hotel company in the United States and ran it for 24 years, um, scale with soul meant creating boundaries, um, scaling with purpose. There's a purpose there, but that we had to have boundaries on it because if we didn't have boundaries, like left to my own devices and my driven and ambitious nature, we would have done everything. And so the thing that we did that actually created some semblance of boundaries was to say, we're not going to do a, a boutique hotel outside of California. And that, so our purpose was to be the lifestyle brand of hotels for California. And California has a very iconic brand, um, although a bit tarnished compared to what it used to be. But the bottom line is I I said that was how I would could scale with purpose or scale with soul, meaning I didn't just scale for the sake of scale. Um, because by knowing that all of our hotels were going to be in California, each one was handcrafted as a boutique hotel should be. Each had its own name and own brand, et cetera. When I went to Airbnb, um, similarly, I was was the in-house mentor to the to the founders of Airbnb, and they called me the modern elder, which basically meant that they said, "Chip, you're as curious as you are wise," and that's how they define a the modern elder. But the way we actually tried to scale with purpose there was to make sure that every single person we hired had to go through a core values interview. Um, so if you're on the engineering team and you're interviewing with four or five engineers and you're going to be hired there, great. But you had to go to a core values interview also. In fact, over time, we had two of them. So you had two different people who were different departments, not engineers, trained, uh, and they had their own normal job. But on the side, they would do core values and in interviews. And what they would look for is, is this person not just good at what they do? and their task and their skill, but they also buy into the, the purpose of the organization, the soul of the organization. And, and, and you know, I can, I can tell you um, that when we would have an engineer who was supposed to become on board and, and everybody wanted to hire this person, they were a rock star, but they failed their core values interviews. There was no way around that, you know? Um, so to me, what you have to do, especially you have to have both. If you have a lot of purpose or a lot of soul, but no no scaling, um, that's not a good business model. Similarly, if you have all the scaling, but no the per not the purpose or the soul, what you end up with is a product that actually feels very manufactured and 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 soulless. And so I think that they both go together. You speak directly to the second principle of our ten principle scale X framework, and we've put them together, purpose and vision, deliberately because we believe they're hand and love. Vision without purpose is a distracting illusion in many respects. Um, and purpose without vision is a huge potential unrealized. So, uh, you know, you can't have one without the other, I, I feel. And I love that. I've never heard that scaling with soul. 
I'm curious because I, I want to touch on Airbnb before we kind of unpack this role as modern elder, which is just wonderful. Uh, you mentioned specifically the the guys hiring for values, in particular congruence to to the the purpose and soul of the organization, even if they were a technical rock star. How would they discern if someone was aligned to the purpose and soul of Airbnb, Chip? Well, yeah, we have to start with what are the values of Airbnb? And back then there were five or six, now there are four. Um, and so, and, and I'm not going to try to remember all four because <laughs> it's been a while since I've been in the company. Um, but the bottom line is, what we would do is we would ha help train the values interviewers on what are the kinds of questions that will help you get underneath the surface. So for example, if one of the, I, I remember one of them off the top of my head, which is be a serial entrepreneur. And um, that there's a, a joke in that, in the sense that when uh, uh, Joe and Brian in 2008 were trying to raise money for Airbnb, they created a box of cereal like not the normal serial entrepreneur way of thinking, but a box of cereal with the two candidates running for president. One, a cereal box for McCain, one for Obama. And it was, it showed some ingenuity and they were not in the business of selling cereal, but the venture capitalists, some of them took note and said, these, these guys are, these guys have sense, a sense of humor and, and are, seem very uh, creative. Um, and so being a serial entrepreneur in the company for us means are you at Airbnb is, are you creative, resourceful, entrepreneurial, et cetera? So what we'd want to understand is if the, let's say this, you know, random engineer is interviewing, what, what, what have they done in their life that actually showed evidence that they're resourceful or creative or entrepreneurial? How have they made do with less? Um, what's their biggest mistake they've made and what have they learned from it in their career? These are the kinds of things that we would try to get to. We would try to ask questions that got underneath the surface. My favorite question that I loved asking was, what's the number one way you're misperceived at work? Because it's a hard question. It's like, okay, let us let me see. How am I misperceived at work? Hmm, people perceive me as this, but I'm that. People perceive me as a nice guy and I'm just a jerk. Usually they say the opposite. I, I'm perceived as a jerk, but I'm a nice guy. I'm like, okay, let's tell me more. But, um, the most important thing to do in an interview is to put the person off balance. Because, and I, and I say that with respect, it has to be done respectfully too. So you want people to not regurgitate the normal thing they say in an interview. You want to ask them questions that are a bit of a surprise for them. Because you want to see the, how they think. You also want to see how how do they show up emotionally when they're a little agitated. Um, so I I'm a big I'm a big fan of interviews. So I uh, I was sort of the lead person helping the company get good at that. And and a lot of entrepreneurs really undervalue how important it is um, in terms of the the value. How do you how do you make sure that you have quality coming into the company? Uh, you know, it's, it's so essential, especially when you're growing quickly at Airbnb, we're doubling in size every year in terms of our employee count. And so half the, half the, half the company had not been there a year. So that's why this core values thing became really important. And the collection of people who were doing those core value in, uh, interviews had been in the company at least four years. So they really understood the company. And, um, yeah, unfortunately what happens in a lot of companies is if they're not thoughtful about this, the people doing the interviews of the new people have been there six months. And like, okay, do they really understand how this business works? Um, so, yeah. There's so much in that. And there's so many different ways we could take that. Just before we, we get into your wonderful book, I want to just understand a little bit further your experience at, at Airbnb, especially in the context of their their scaling experience. So given, given the importance of maintaining soul within the business, and, and I love the way in Joie de Vivre, you, you, you really contained that and you were very deliberate about the boundaries that you set. That 
would have been very different in Airbnb given the the global <laughs> yeah. scale and growth. So how how did you take that uh, essence of soul and bring it to to Airbnb whilst they went on this uh, global scaling uh, incredible journey? So so there's a there's a um, a position in the U.S. government called the Secretary of State. And the Secretary of State is a person whose job it is to be the chief diplomat for the company. They're typically on the road all the time, and they're usually thrown into the most difficult situations. Guess who was Secretary of State of Airbnb? Um, Brian called me that many times because we, yeah, it was the opposite of, of Joie de Vivre. Joie de Vivre, like, okay, we're going to you know, limit ourselves to California. Airbnb very quickly as a global network effect business, a business that actually built on a marketplace. Uh, and, you know, Uber, for example, can be very localized in a market. Most of the time you're using Uber, you might do it in the place you live. But um, Airbnb was, you know, this is like, a, this is a global business. It has to be. So it really required a lot of diplomacy, a lot of go me going out and not just me alone. Let's be really clear. There were a lot of great people. When I first joined, there was a, there was a one and a half person, two person public policy team. By the time I left, there were about 60 people in public policy because, you know, the, the, the laws that we were dealing with were all local laws. And therefore, but when I, when I joined, it was a tiny company. And so therefore I was wearing lots of hats. And I would just say that I would never have said to Brian, let's let's reduce our aspirations for um, where we're going to go. But what I would say, and this was one of the things I, I did say over and over again, is number one is we can't do too many things. Like let's like we had, when I joined the company, there were thirty strategic initiatives, and not even Brian, as the CEO and co-founder, could actually recite them all. So we did a offsite. We came became clear that we were in not in the home sharing business. We were in the belong anywhere business. And once we knew that, we said, okay, what are four strategic initiatives that we needed to come up with and take 30 and take them down to four. And so we did that. We did all of that in the first four months after I joined. Um, and that was re really important. So that was a boundary. So we didn't have a geographic boundary, but we had a aspirational strategic initiative boundary. Um, I also was really focused on quality. You know, I, I said to Brian, um, if we want to be the most successful, most effective, most, you know, popular hospitality company in the world, and ultimately we became the most valuable hospitality company in the world, we've got to focus on quality. And so um, <laughs> that, that put me at odds a little bit with some of the, uh, the product team whose whose perspective was like we need we need product because there was demand was growing faster than supply and in some markets in order to get to a place where there was enough business in the market to make it worthwhile you know what, what's called liquidity in the in the marketplace you had to have more more um, listings but I was in charge of all the hosts in the world and I could tell you there were some spectacular hosts and there were some terrible ones and we needed to figure out a way how to create the carrot and the stick. Um, and the carrot was how do we create a super host program and, and then really elevate those who are doing a quality job? And how do we help our guests understand what a super host is and what they should expect as a result of that? So that's, that was the carrot. Um, and that became very successful. I mean, that was maybe the most effective, uh, cost effective or highest ROI return on investment thing I ever did in my seven and a half years in the company, four years full-time, three and a half years part-time. The other thing was we did the stick and we just said like, okay, we need to remove listings that are consistently uh, underperforming. Uh, we need to educate them. We need to create an education process so that hosts can understand before they're going to be delisted what they need to do. And we need to see if they improve. But at the end of the day, we need to we need to do that. We also need to really dramatically improve our review system. Um, one of the things that Airbnb had going for it is that we were not getting our reviews on TripAdvisor. So if you're a hotel, you know nobody fills out hotel comment cards. They just go to TripAdvisor or wherever. 
But with Airbnb, 70% of our hosts and guests were reviewing each other. And it was a two-sided marketplace of reviews too. So that whole thing needed to be, there had to be a lot of psychology built into that. How is that going to work? And if you want to dive deep on that, I could, but I will just leave it at this point to say, I'm really proud that Airbnb went from having customer satisfaction scores that were about 50% lower than the hotel industry. And when I left, they were 50% higher than the hotel industry, primarily because we got rid of the bad quality. We elevated the the, the, the good quality uh, listings uh, and hosts, and we created a review system that allowed us to iterate and allowed us to help a, a listing uh, or a host know exactly what's not working. We could then help them to understand what do you do to improve that and you get better. And because our hosts are entrepreneurs and I'm an entrepreneur um, and I'm a hospitality entrepreneur and you know, I, I was, I, you know, I was a bit of a hero to them and they, you know, chip going around the world and doing world tours to visit hosts, including in Dublin multiple times because Airbnb has a large presence in Dublin. Um, long story short is that's, you know, I just talked too long. I just realized I could keep, I could talk about this forever. No, I love it. Um, and it's wonderful for our listeners to to hear of the Airbnb story and and get in under the bonnet of Airbnb. Keen, before we leave that, you were there seven and a half years. Can you just share with our listeners, Chip, the the size of the business when you joined, number of employees uh, versus that when you ended, maybe number of listings and a, and a sense of the revenue. And I want. Uh, I would like you just to share that as context for the next question, which is what were two or three of the biggest scaling challenges that you guys had? So when I joined, we had 125, I don't remember the revenues, so we had 125 employees. When I left, we had 7,500 employees. So from 125 to 7,500 in seven, seven, seven and a half years. Um, scaling challenges, uh, <laughs> well, beyond just the quality one, um, which is an important one, I, I'd say quality was one, regulatory was another. Is you know how do we how do we scale? In the early days, when I first joined, uh, Airbnb did everything it could to just be under underneath the radar. Um, but by the time I got there, that we were going mainstream, and so it's like you know what we got we got to get taxed. We got to be regulated. And that when I first said that to, to Brian, he was like, are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> there are not many companies out there that would actually say, oh, we want to be taxed. We want to be regulated. But over time, it became our, our motto because it was a sign of our legitimacy. And um, when I started at Airbnb, I mean, the hotel industry looked at me like, what are you doing? <laughs> that company's never going anywhere. And it's a stupid idea. And it's, it's an outlaw company. And uh, so I knew we really needed, we had a long way to go to try to be legitimate. Um, and so the, whether it's the trust and safety issues or the regulatory issues or paying taxes, when I say paying taxes, I mean, occupancy taxes. Uh, it varies depending upon the municipality, but it's what a tourist pays or a business traveler pays when they're staying in a hotel. There's a tax. Um, and Airbnb was not paying that tax because it, the regula regulations didn't say Airbnb had to pay the tax, to be honest with you. There was no there was no, no tax associated with home sharing. But as home sharing got really big um, and the hotel industry started noticing, uh-oh, and the convention business, you know, meeting planners and corporate meeting planners started noticing it and travel agents noticed it and et cetera. We needed to be able to be in a position where we were playing by the same rules generally. I'll, 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 there's an asterisk there as hotels. Why The reason I say generally is because someone renting a cottage in their backyard shouldn't have the same regulatory burden as someone you know uh, owning a 500 room hotel convention hotel. Of course not. But the question is what sh regulatory should be included there and what shouldn't. And that's part of what we had to get into. Um, so I, I, so that regulatory piece was a huge, huge burden on our growth. You know, it was a very big problem there. I would say also the media was a, a scaling issue for us. Um, 
there were periods of time where there might be a high profile situation where someone trashed a home, uh, some, a host's home, a guest trashed a host's home, or someone fell off a balcony or something like that. And you don't hear about those things in the hotel. As being a hotelier, having 52 boutique hotels, I can tell you that there was never ever an, a situation where the fact that we had a band trash one of our guest rooms um, did not make the front page of the paper. But if it was an Airbnb guest, it did. And, and um, if someone fell off, if someone hurt themselves, you know, broke their arm, hit their head, you know, in a hotel, you don't find out about that in the paper, but you do if it's an Airbnb. So how we managed the media and the press associated with Airbnb, which at times was fawning and beautiful. And like, we love Airbnb, the media loves Airbnb. And then at other times, like Airbnb is the devil. Um, there was a sense that we had to manage that well, because that influenced not just the growth of the number of hosts and guests we had, but it also affected, you know, politicians and residents in the city. So, you know, we had, when I joined Airbnb, um, I, I said to Brian, we're always compared to Uber. I mean, they talk about the, the sharing economy darlings. No one uses that language anymore. But back 10, 12 years ago, when I started at Airbnb, that Uber and Airbnb were the sharing economy darlings. And yet Uber had a very different culture than Airbnb. And I said to Brian early on, we cannot be seen as transactional. Uber has a transactional business. It's transporting you from here to there. And yes, there's stuff, safety and trust and all that, but it's it's pretty much a transaction. Airbnb is not meant to be transaction. It is, we do transactions, but it's people being in each other's homes. There's a lot more safety issues. There's a lot more, It's it's a it can be an uplifting transformational experience, not a transactional experience. And therefore we better be a, a disruptive, you know, if Uber's a disruptor and we're a disruptor, we better realize we're a disruptor in the hospitality industry. So we better disrupt in a way that feels generous and friendly. And so we shifted some of our thinking on this uh, about how we would go into markets by, by trying to be a little bit more, I don't know, open to war and friendly in our approach. And I sense you had a very, very strong influence in that chip, just given the the warmth and the the energy and the 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 amplification of uh, quality in what you guys were doing. And because it, there's no doubt that the business model could have been one where it was very transactional, and 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 you guys just facilitated that. But clearly, the direction that you took. Uh, and continue to take is not that. I suspect that recruiting a thousand people a year for seven and a half years was also a little bit of a challenge. That just sounds incredible and and maintaining and all over the that world. culture. We had twenty. We had twenty two offices around the world. So like, yeah. How do you you know from a cultural perspective? Once a year, we would we did something called one Airbnb, and we would bring every one of our employees to San Francisco for a four day festival. And it was not just fun. It was also obviously educational, et cetera. And that was part of the, so the scale with purpose. So we decided to spend that much money um, scaling with culture. You know, that was really it, culture and purpose. Um, so that was a really interesting investment that we made. Once we got to 3,000 employees, it was really hard to do it after that. But I was involved in four of those. Incredible. And... Were you guys involved in in much of the recruitment, you know, for the first, you know, 500 people, first 1,000 people, you know, in terms of that, that doubling in size every year, um, you know, by, by year three, there was, you know, more people who had been in the company less than a couple of years <laughs> than there were yeah. there since the start, you know. So uh, how, how, did you, how did you ensure, so you got together uh, once a year, uh, but were you guys directly involved in the recruitment? Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I would interview, I, I, as I said earlier, I love doing interviews. So I, I would be brought into interviews sometimes where a person's on the bubble and we're not, we weren't exactly sure, like yes or no. It's sort of like there's, 
and and Brian and Nate and Joe, the three co-founders, would do a lot of the interviewing as well. Now, at some point, you can't do that anymore. But the the reality is that Brian is a workaholic, and um, man, he does a lot. So, uh, in many ways, he was um, he was a great interviewer because he would typically come at the interview from a different perspective. And I and I'm a little proud because I think I helped him in terms of interviewing style. We, we have very different energies. I'm a little bit more friendly and easygoing and he's a pretty intense little guy a uh, little he's, he's, he's relatively short and so i think he tries to make up for it by being a bit of a steamroller at times so what i had to help, help him to see is that you know when you're interviewing a person uh you don't want to necessarily intimidate them straight out of the gates you 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 want to make sure they're comfortable but you want to put, put them off balance you want to put them off balance, as I said earlier, because you get to see the real person. But you want to do that in a way that they're not suspecting. And that's that requires you to build some trust with them in the first five or 10 minutes in an interview. And and because if you don't do that, if you don't build the trust on the front end, um, then that person's going to just clam up potentially. And, and frankly, it's not going to be a good interview because they don't say anything. They end up yeah, and that that that's not that's that's not that doesn't help anybody. And given that you've interviewed thousands of people, what do you guys do? What can you share with our listeners, Chip, to support our listeners in increasing the probability of a successful hire? So you've given some insight there in terms of how to manage the interview process. You know, build trust in the first five to ten minutes. You want pe to get the best out of people, but certainly during the interview to agitate them in some way. So you, you see how they respond under pressure. Do they bite back? Do they get angry? Do they yeah. clam up? You know. But what else can you share in terms of, you know, have you have you that now really dialed in? So there's kind of four things that you know that if you do this, 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 and this, we know that we're going to increase our probability of successful yeah. hire from fifty percent to ninety percent. Well, that first question I asked, I mentioned earlier, which is, you know, what's the number one way you're misperceived? I, I like to ask that question, you know, within the first 15 minutes of the interview, because it actually opens the door to other things, because often it leads to me understanding their personality a little bit better. Um, I also like to ask, you know, if they've ever done a personality assessment, we didn't require them at Airbnb. But if, have they done the Enneagram or Myers-Briggs or et cetera? And if they've done that, I'd love to have them help me to understand, you know, how what is their type um, and how much of that feels accurate to them, what doesn't feel accurate. Because actually unpacking this idea of not their accomplishments, but more like who are they? What is their character? Um because the the a lot of times we get very you know wrapped up in oh I helped grow revenues forty two percent over two years blah, blah, blah. and like I, you didn't do that alone <laughs> I mean yes you were and and you may have been in the company that was growing that fast anyways or, you know so I don't I don't really get you know most inter, most LinkedIn profiles or resumes pretty much like that's what it's all a bunch of stats and I want what I want to understand is the character of the person. I really want to understand what's the biggest embarrassment you've ever had in the workplace and how did it feel and what did you learn from it? Because our painful life lessons are the raw material for our future wisdom. So if you're not exploring with that person, their painful life lessons, their painful work lessons, their, their, the things they've learned along the way that has allowed them to metabolize their experience distill it down to what's the wisdom they took from it. So I want to, I want wisdom. I don't care about knowledge. You know, I can get knowledge at chat GBT, but I want someone's wisdom and wisdom is hard earned and hard won based upon what they have made mistakes on. Um, and it's really, you know, you go that direction. Some people find my interviews to be intense, in but I, it's like intense Intensely curious is what people usually will say. It's like, it's intense, but it's also, I'm curious. Therefore, it's not intensely judgmental. It's not intensely combative. It's just like, I really want to understand you. 
by the end of this 45 minutes I have with you, I want to understand how you tick. Now, for some people that will be intimidating because it feels like, man, I just feel like I've just been sitting in therapy. Um, and that's not such a bad thing, in my opinion, because I want to uncover what makes this person tick. And I want to know in advance how this might fail. In fact, that's one of my favorite questions also, especially for a senior level person I'm hiring is what's the most, you know, first of all, what, you know, what are your biggest concerns about us as a company? Yeah, tell me, tell me what your concerns are. And, and then they may have one that I've never thought of. And I love that. Or, um, you know, if this didn't succeed based upon your past experiences where you were in a particular culture or you had a particular boss, knowing your experiences from that, what's the most likely way this would not succeed? And how will we have some early evidence of that if that if we're on that path? And what are we going to do about it? Now, that's a really hard question because it's sort of saying, like, instead of like saying, here's why I want to work here and da, 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 it's more like, no, um, let's look at, let's actually try to imagine, you know, the worst case scenario here. And then let's see how do we unwind that and make sure that doesn't happen. Um, I love interviewing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting a sense of that. Uh, you're also a wonderful interviewee. You mentioned wisdom a number of times in, in that last answer. And I have to say, for those listening, you won't be able to see me holding up Chip's wonderful book, Learning to Love Midlife, 12 Reasons Why Life Gets Better with the Age. And you have absolutely packed this with lived insight, your own experiences, and, and just so much wisdom. I've, I absolutely love this book. I've recommended it to so many people over the last week um, since, I've, since I've been reading it. I'm 49. I was 49 uh, a number of weeks ago. And I feel that you wrote this book for me, so thank you. <laughs> what what inspired you to to write a book about midlife and kind of just help people completely reframe midlife? Yeah. So I, uh, you know, my my life and work story is I was from twenty six to fifty uh, the CEO of my boutique hotel company. In the last four or five years of that time, around 46 to 49, I hated it. I didn't, I, my life was falling apart on many levels, including my company because of the great recession. And I had an NDE, I had a flatline experience. I died and, you know, uh, it, it went flatline nine times in 90 minutes um, due to an allergic reaction to an antibiotic. And so I came through that period and I got through it, but I said like, man, midlife sucks. You know, I don't, I, I don't, I don't, I don't like this. And then I got into my fifties and I had my best decade ever, partly because of my experience at Airbnb. I, two years after I sold my company, uh, the Airbnb founders came after me and said, listen, we want to be a hospitality company when we, when we, we grow up. We're a tech company. Help us, you know, help us democratize hospitality. And so between that and having some freedom in my life, having had a long-term relationship end, which was the right thing and having had, you know, my health come back to, together I found my fifties to be really um, remarkable. And I saw that I had some wisdom to offer in this tech company and I never worked in a tech company. Um, and so toward the end of my full-time work at Airbnb, I decided I was gonna write a book called Wisdom at Work, The Making of a Modern Elder. And that uh, was basically my story of being at Airbnb. And while I was writing that book down in Baja, Baja is a part of Mexico. Uh, the south of California, it's also known as Baja, California, but it's in Mexico it, on a beach. I had this this epiphany one day. I went for, running on the beach and I had a Baja aha and an epiphany of why don't we have midlife wisdom schools? Why don't we have a place where I could have come when I was selling Joie de Vivre saying like, what's next? Because I felt pretty lost, quite frankly. Midlife is a life stage that doesn't get the love and attention that some other life stages get. And um, and so I decided I was going to create MEA, the Modern Elder Academy, the world's first midlife wisdom school. This book you're talking about, Learning to Love Midlife, is the result of six and a half years of me having 5,000 people from 50 countries around the world come to that beach in Mexico 
to go through a week long program. And now we have a location where I am right here in Santa Fe, New Mexico on a 2,600 acre regenerative horse ranch. So I just wanted to capture both the social science around midlife uh, and later life, what gets better with age, because we know what gets worse, worse with age, because <laughs> everybody will remind us of that. And then what I learned from these people who've come to our program, who have an average age of 54. Um, and so I wanted to write a book about it. And and to, quite frankly, when I said this to my literary agent, who's, you know, this is my seventh book, he said, hey, Chip, no one wants to read about midlife. <laughs> I mean, it's like a life stage that has like, doesn't get any respect. And he said, that's just a bad idea. But I said, I said, not only do I want to write a book about midlife, I want the title to say, learning to love midlife. Because actually, as you get older, you learn to love Brussels sprouts and classical music and a few other things. <laughs> and midlife is one of those things you start to learn to love when you realize that midlife is not a crisis, it's a chrysalis. Between a caterpillar and a butterfly is the chrysalis. It's dark and gooey and solitary, as it can sometimes feel at age 50. And it's also where the transformation happens. And, and there's a reason why I say that, and that's because the U-curve of happiness research shows that after age 50, we get happier with each decade uh, after that. Yeah. I, and you have this beautiful line in the book, and it's only the, the, the cover art uh, mm -hmm. came to me then, obviously, as I read the book, but you have just the beautiful line, a caterpillar consumes, a chrysalis transforms, a butterfly pollinates. And, and it really struck me that we want more business leaders to be pollinators. And what I feel, and certainly if you're listening to this and you think, oh, no, I'm listening to these two guys talk about midlife. I'm in my 30s. This isn't for me. What I urge you to do is stay on because if I had learned, if I had read this book in my 30s, I feel, well, would I? But I would hope that I would bring some of this wisdom to my leadership in my 30s. Because whilst this is a book about learning to love midlife, what I feel is that that everyone can learn from this book and not wait to midlife before you actually arrive at this place where kind of this wisdom unfolds, but actually grab this wisdom and 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 bring it into your life right now. So so that's what I'm urging you to do. If you're listening to this and and you don't feel you're in midlife, albeit I'm going to challenge that because um, I, <laughs> define midlife, uh, Chip. Yeah. This, this was news to me in the book. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 new to a lot of people. Uh, a lot of sociologists have told me that midlife is the life stage between early adulthood and later adulthood. That makes sense. Early, mid, later. So what's early adulthood? Well, early adulthood usually ends around 30 or 35, let's say 35. And when does later adulthood happen? Well, that depends on you know how healthy you are and where you're living. But in a world in which more and more people are living into their 90s and, and are becoming centenarians, maybe 75 is when the later adult happens. So is it possible that midlife lasts from 35 to 75, in essence, four decades? And I think it can be broken down into three stages. Early, early midlife would be 35 to 50. The core of midlife would be 50 to 60. And then later midlife would be 60 to 75. And each of those phases are, have different flavors. So um, the 35 to 50 is really a time where you're just burning yourself out. You are, um, you have a lot of obligations, you have some disappointments, uh, you don't have a lot of time for yourself. Um, you're sort of on the treadmill and your, 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 your sort of ego run wild. Um, and I'm, again, I'm, these, this is not just Chip's perspective. This is social science research that I'm talking about here. And so that's a period that where, you know, you go from maybe feeling on top of the world in your 30s to in your 40s starting to feel like, shit, um, <laughs> this isn't going the way I thought it would. And um, also what happens in, in your late 40s is you get more and more aware of mortality uh, just because more people, parents, et cetera, are passing. 50s to 60s are the liberation era. It's also sort of where you're in the chrysalis a little bit. And it's, so there's a, a bit of transformation happening, but you start to lighten the load. The first half of your life is about accumulating. The second half of your life is about editing. And you start to become a really good editor in your 50s. 
and you don't give a F anymore what other people think of you necessarily. It doesn't mean you don't care about other people. It just means like you don't care so much like what other people say or think and you know, you, you do less comparing. And then 60 to 75 is just preparing for a later part of your life. And preferably, you know, having some wisdom that you've accumulated that you can actually share. You can do that at any age. I mean, to be honest with you, I know 30 year olds who are more wise than 70 year olds. There's a lot of them because the 70 year old hasn't like learned how to metabolize their life experience. Um, and the 30 year old has. You mentioned the, you know, the, the wisdom that some 35 year olds have versus some 70 year olds, but what can we learn from, from midlife which you mention is a period that is very liberating. We learn not to give an F anymore. You know, what, what else can we learn that really only reveals itself for many people in midlife, which they wish they'd known decades earlier because something fear of maybe a fear of judgment, a fear of what other people would think of them, a fear of failure that all of a sudden they arrive in a place in midlife in their, in their fifties. I'm really looking forward to this decade. Now you're selling it to me, Chip. Thank you, my friend. Um, you know, what, what are the things that, that liberate people in, in midlife, which, which really others can learn earlier? And if they did, it would certainly support them in scaling with purpose uh, and accelerating that scaling with purpose earlier. I mean, I, there's a few things. Number one is caring less what others think of you because they're not thinking of you that much. <laughs> so there's that. Number two is there's a term that we are popularizing called successism. Consumerism is a term that came like 70 years ago, based upon the premise that you're trying to keep up with the Joneses down the street. Um, you want to have a BMW in your garage, just like they do. And so successism is like that, except for it's not so much defined upon physical stuff. It's more defined upon how you define success and how your parents define success or your community defines success. Midlife is when you should get really clear on what matters to you and worry less about satisfying others and worry more about saying like, what, how can I get clear about what matters to me? What are my values? What is my purpose? Um, what means something to me? And that's part of what we help people with at MEA at the Modern Elder Academy. And we also have online courses where we do that too. Um, so long story short is uh, that's another p key piece of it. Um, and another piece is like knowing what to let go of, you know, um, this editing function, we, we have a, a collective ritual. We do it in a, a workshop called the great midlife edit that helps people to say like what mindsets or obligations or archetypes or identities of who we are are ready to let, we're like, we want to let go of it. It just, it's not serving us anymore. And, and then what do you replace it with? So I, I'd say in some a lot of midlife is the idea of molting, you know, like a, a snake molts its skin and a caterpillar goes into the chrysalis and liquefies. That, that's what's supposed to happen in midlife. It, that, that's what freaks people out about midlife. That's why people, you know, Kevin Spacey in American Beauty goes out and buys a red sports car and has an affair with his, you know, daughter's high school best friend is because you freak out that it, you're, that as Brené Brown, the sociologist, famous sociologist says, it's the great midlife unraveling. You're unraveling a lot of your expectations and obligations and way you've, the way you've been. And for some, that means, oh, I, I want to go back to adolescence. I want to go back to when I was young. And therefore, they, you know, they sort of take that path. That path will serve them for a while. And I'm not saying we shouldn't try to stay healthy in our bodies. But if you go egocentric on this and go trying to go back and be, you know, Peter Pan, 18 year old again, um, at some point, that's not going to look very good on you. <laughs> um, and you're not growing up in all kinds of other ways, because guess what? Midlife, midlife, your body, yeah, it starts to fall apart a little bit, but your heart, you know, your emotional intelligence is better as you age. Your spiritual curiosity is better as you age. Your relational intelligence, your ability to be a good friend gets better with age. 
wisdom improves with age. Crystallized intelligence, which is different than fluid intelligence, Arthur Brooks wrote about this in From Strength to Strength, gets better with age. So there's a bunch of things that get better with age. And that's why I wanted to write this book, because I wanted to have a pro-aging, not an anti-aging message. Good on you. There's so much of that resonates uh, so, so strongly. My wife has just come back, actually, from doing the Camino. and. Oh, wow. I, I'm envious. Well, and, and everything that you're saying there in terms of for years, you know, this, this collection, this accumulation mentality of, you know, as you strive through your career, well, then, you know, the, the result of that success in the context of the modern world is to collect lots of things, the houses, the cars, the, you know, all of the, all of the trappings that are associated with, what we deem success to be. And uh, it was interesting because my wife went and she came back and she immediately, she spent the next day clearing out her entire wardrobes. And I mean, there was just bags and bags. I said, what are you doing with all of that? She said, said I carried all that I needed around uh, Northern Spain for the last eight days. And I realized that you know, I was very, very happy carrying all of this. I don't need anything that I haven't worn in the last six months I'm getting rid of. And, yeah. um, and I'm sharing that with someone else. She also in recent years has qualified as a nutritionist, having spent years as a teacher, leaving that career and to support females over 40. And I've never, I've never seen anyone live in their purpose, aligned to the purpose as much as, as, as she's doing and, you know, she's now running her own business. And previously she, she would have had no knowledge of business as such, um, other than what she would have heard of from me in the context of her own business. Now, uh, now she's, she's chatting to me about lead funnels and all sorts of things, <laughs> wow. which, is, which is very interesting. But, um, so she, you know, I, I've, I've, I've uh, passed your book on to her and said, read this. Cause this is, this is just, this is just you, you know, you mentioned and you alluded to it there, Chip, you know, the different transformations that we go through in midlife, physical, emotional, mental, vocational, and spiritual. Now, given the time that we'd let, that we've left. I'd love you to to pick up uh, on those and and to share with with our listeners some of the changes that we will go through that are actually um, emboldening and 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 empowering in many respects. And if we've knowledge of those now, that if we're not quite approaching midlife of the actually then you know, there are things that we can lean on in the context of physical practices, emotional practices, mental practices right. that will help us be better leaders. So, so let's take the last, the, you know, the next 10 minutes, if we can do a little mini master class on those. Yeah. So let's start with the physical. Um, first of all, people are way underestimating how long they're going to live. They, we don't have good longevity literacy. So if you're 54 years old, which is the average age of the person who comes to MEA, and you're going to live till 90, which there's a moderately good chance of that, especially if, especially if you're a, a Caucasian woman um, and, you know, and educated. The, the fact is at age 54, you're not even half, you're only halfway through your adult life if you start counting at age 18. And that, that math, the idea like, oh my God, at 54, I have as much adulthood behind me, 54 minus 18, as ahead of me, 90 minus 54. Wow. So that's when, when you have that kind of mentality, you may take better care of your body. You may take, you may look at retirement differently. You also get to a place where you realize also that your body doesn't define you anymore. And this is particularly important for women. Um, you know, the idea of a woman's body and face has defined her her whole life. She gets to midlife and it's like, man, this is a lot of work, a lot of work keeping this up. And you start to realize, okay, maybe you can let your hair go gray. And if you're a guy, you know, maybe you're going to still work out. It's important to take care of this rental vehicle we were issued at, at birth. Um, but the bottom line is, uh, you know, you're not as obsessive about it potentially. So that's the physical side is, you know, yes, the body, you know, just as you get comfortable in your own skin, it starts to sag. The bottom line is um, that takes us to the second category, which is emotional life. And, you know, this is where you get comfortable in your own skin. Um, and the getting comfortable in your own skin feels good. It's like you learn how to dance with your emotions. You're less re emotionally reactive. 
Um, and you sort of see your emotions as something that just passes through you. And I know this is not true of your angry uncle or whomever. There are lots of people who do not get more emotionally intelligent as they get older. But on average, we do. Um, IQ doesn't grow with age, but EQ does. We also get better at social wellness and at social relations, partly because we start to value our relationships more. Um, in our 20s, 30s, and 40s, we often, uh, especially if we're really busy, we lose track of friends and friendships. Um, and that's normal. It's not unusual because there's a lot going on in our lives. And then we wake up in our 50s, and sort of like, especially men, and say like, I don't really have a lot of friends, or I don't have I don't have the friends I can have deep, meaningful conversations with. And we realize that our friendship muscle may have atrophied. Well, the solution for that is to think of friendship as a practice. And often in midlife, to think of friendship as a practice means you actually work at it. You go out and build those friendships and reconnect with people that you haven't been with in, you know, in years. Um, and you you invest in, in the friendships. Bob Waldinger at Harvard uh, in his research has shown that the number one variable for people who are happy and healthy in their 80s and 90s is how invested were they in relationships in their 50s and beyond. So it's important. Um, fr friends are not a nice to have, they're a need to have. And then um, the other thing in that category of emotions is just learning to like not care so much what other people think about you and get much more clear about why you're, what your purpose here is on earth. Then we have to go to the mental side of things, the mental side, like wisdom, like, you, you know, back to the, the wisdom. I, this is my topic these days. Um, you know, we live in, in an era of AI and, and all of the knowledge of the world is commoditized and therefore human wisdom is the thing that can balance that artificial intelligence. And human wisdom is something you learn based upon life experience. So, uh, you know, at, at the end, I'm going to, when you ask for takeaways, I'm going to give you a wisdom practice that anybody could start doing. And I've been doing it since age 28. So I've been doing it for 35 years. Um, learning how to edit your life is really important too. And that's another mental practice of like, like how are you editing it? On the vocational side, um, getting off the fucking treadmill. I mean, it doesn't mean you shouldn't stop working. I mean, or you should stop working. It just means don't work for the sake of work. Don't work because you're trying to keep up with somebody else's expectations of you. And I think in midlife, a lot of people start to ask that question. And sometimes out of necessity, maybe they got fired or maybe they're the business that they started, um, uh, you know, got, uh, you know, had to go, uh, I don't know, just had to stop being in business. And and therefore you you get faced with some challenges and you have, you, rather than running into the next thing, taking some space to actually imagine what you really want to do is really important. Um, and then uh, the other part is time affluence. Uh, you know, vocationally, we do, as we get older, um, we learn if we're doing these other things, editing, getting off the treadmill, we create some space in our lives. And with that space is the opportunity to become a beginner again. Now, this sounds weird for a midlifer. It's like, what do you, I don't want to be a midlifer. I mean, I don't want to be a beginner. Jeff, I, you know, being a beginner means I look stupid. Well, the reality is um, curiosity and an openness to new experience are very correlated to living a longer, healthier, happier life. So how do we create the conditions for ourselves to become beginners? Number one, we have to have the space to be curious and to try new things. We have to be less self-critical. So I have another exercise at the end to take away that relates to that. And then finally, there's the spiritual side of things. And the spiritual side of things really important. Like, you know what? Um, as we get older, um, we move from, you know, the operating system of the ego to the operating system of the soul. And there's, it's around midlife that that transition happens. And that means we move from sort of like being focused on what we want to get accomplished and, and how we want to show up in the world to how do we, you know, to, as Eric Erickson, the developmental psychologist calls it, I am what survives me. What's the legacy? What is going to live beyond us? And we start to learn how to grow whole and feel like we're not compartmentalized. Um, we are both an extrovert and an introvert. We're both curious and wise. We both have gravitas, depth, and levity, humor. And when we can actually embody those polarities and become all of that, 
you can see a person like that. And that's an elder. That's a modern elder, someone with presence. Oh, beautiful. You mentioned editing our lives a few times throughout the, the, the conversation. Uh, what do you mean by that specifically? And, and I'm, you know, I'm certainly thinking about the, the self story that, that we have that holds us back. And I, I'll share with you the lack of ambition of the leader is cited as the single greatest impediment as to why leaders don't scale. Uh, and actually less than 1% of, of small and medium-sized enterprises are scaling, which is quite sad, despite the disproportional positive impact that scaling companies have. Um, in fact, in the UK, the half a percent of the, the 5.7 million SMEs are scale-ups and they contribute more than 50% of the overall revenue of the economy. So we want more companies to, to scale with purpose. But I feel that lack of ambition is a mindset. Ambition is a mindset, of course. When you lift the lid on that, it's it, you know, we've certainly discovered it's there's lots of unchallenged limiting beliefs there that reside within the leaders, yeah. and much of that is is really coded in a in a negative self story. And when you talk about editing our lives, I kind of think literally about editing that story that we've been telling ourselves, which has been really holding us back. Does that resonate, Chip? Is that what you mean when you say editing our story? Yeah, editing, you said the word mindset. That is such a big piece of it. And there's a fixed and a growth mindset. Fixed mindset means you're proving yourself and you define success as winning. And your job is to sort of optimize what you've got but not to actually grow what you've got. A growth mindset is about improving and learning. And um, helping people move from a fix to a growth mindset opens up a lot more options. So yes, part of what you need to edit is the mindset of, I'm terrible with technology. I needed to actually get rid of that mindset when I joined Airbnb. Um, or the, I need to get rid of the mindset of, uh, um, I'm terrible with money. Um, so I, which I don't have that problem. Um, but the bottom line is, you know, mindsets are like the water a fish swims in the, the, the fish doesn't even know it's water, but it's, it defines the landscape. So yes, editing mindsets, but also th that's a little bit abstract. Then it could be like editing, like what I don't like in my life. You know, and, you know, it, it, what is it that I am? And it could be something as simple as like, I have a cousin, I just don't want to talk to anymore. Um, it's toxic. Or it could be more like, I'm going to edit a thought I have, which is that um, my parents don't care about me and they're still living, but they're probably only got five more years. And I want to edit that thought out. Um, and I want to then replace it with, uh, I am going to spend the next five years or however long they're going to live uh, really building a, a deeper relationship with them. And so, so editing out, sometimes it's specific things. I, you know, I only care give everybody else, but not myself. That's something that you, you want to let go of. doesn't mean you don't care give anymore. It's not like it's just a dimmer switch. You, you've been like full on bright lights, helping everybody else. Now you're going to dim it, dim it to 50% so that you can at least give 50% to yourself. Yeah, I love that. I love that concept of, of editing and certainly in relation to mindset. Um, also, I would say editing those things, becoming aware, first of all, which certainly seems to be one of the gifts of midlife is that, that greater level of awareness about how you're showing up and then becoming more aware of your belief systems and understanding which of those serve you and which of those hold you back both professionally and, and personally. So I, I really like that, that concept of editing. What would you say to, to listeners who, as they approach kind of 50, they have, a, they have an eye on retirement? You know, and they're starting to think about winding down and kind of that with the advance of, you know, of, of AI, maybe, you know, they don't have a place in, in the modern world anymore in the context of business. What, what, would, what would you say to them? Well, I would just say, beware of retirement. It can be beautiful. It can give you the opportunity to have the space 
that time affluence to be able to become a beginner again. Um, but also know that retirement accelerates mortality by two years. Um, and why has that happened? It happens because there's three things that can happen in retirement that are not good for your health. Number one is you lose a sense of purpose. Um, so if you're going to retire from something, what are you going to retire to? What's the new thing, the new purpose? Number two is you can lose a sense of community. Um, when you're in the working world, you know part, a lot of the people we interact with are people that we're working with. So what, who's going to be the new social? Who's going to be the new collection of people you're going to interact with? And then number three is the surprising one, um, wellness. So purpose, community, and wellness are the most important variables for living a good long life after retirement. The wellness piece is like, okay, well, wait, I have a lot more time in my life. I guess I'll work out more. I'll go golf more. I'll go walk more with my dog. I'll play basketball, whatever it is. And guess what? When you have less structure in your life because of your work, there's less discipline. And then when you don't have to show up at work and care what people look at, see and see how you look, you you spend less time focusing on the body. And in the U.S., the average retiree watches 47 hours of TV a week, <laughs> which is scary. And so it's in essence 47 hours a week, maybe how much they were working. So they've just basically replaced their work with being a, a couch potato. So I would just say you better be very thoughtful about how you retire. And the last thing I would say is if you've been doing physical labor, if you've been basically burning yourself out and your body out, I see why you want to retire. But increasingly, knowledge workers don't want to retire because their brain's not worn out. Their body's worn out if you're like on a factory line, you know, and or doing manual labor. But if your brain is the thing you've been selling all these years because you're a knowledge worker, it's not like at 60 or 62 or 65, your brain's not working anymore. In fact, you may be at the peak period of performance in terms of what you could be doing, depending upon your profession. Yeah, so, so profound. And I suspect part of the reason why uh, the, the guys at Airbnb lent on you and your incredible experience and wisdom at that stage to support their scaling journey in Airbnb. I love this term, modern elder. Uh, was it something that they had coined uh, prior to you coming in? or it's, no, not prior. it's just after I was there and they said, Chip, we hired you for your knowledge, but what you brought is your wisdom. I said, oh, thank you. That, that's good to hear. And, they, and you're our modern elder. I was like, oh, fuck you. I don't want to be a modern elder. <laughs> it's fun of my age. I was 52. The average age in the company was 26. And so, yeah, as relatively speaking, I was an elder, but I thought, it, I thought they meant sort of an old school elder. But they said a modern elder. And they said, Chip, a modern elder is someone who's as curious as they are wise. It's not about reverence. It's about relevance. And you are relevant. And so, God, that made me feel like, wow, I I want to be a modern elder when I grow up. So, so yeah. And so I doubled down on it with the name of our academy. Yeah, I, I love it. And, and certainly I say to those in their, in their 50s coming into our own ScaleX Accelerator program, our 12-month program to support leaders in, in scaling with purpose, you know, when they kind of, flippantly will throw away, ah, look, you know, I've only a few years left. I think, you know, you've just referenced the science and the research that actually we're living much longer at 50, you know, for many of us, uh, potentially, you know, we're, we're, we're just beyond maybe halfway through our entire, our entire time on this planet. So, you know, I encourage them to, to reflect on their experience from the previous two decades in business and think of what they've achieved and actually given that experience, think now what they can actually leverage in the next two decades, leaning on that experience and that knowledge, plus then having the wisdom to really apply that knowledge. So, uh, so we're very aligned on that. And, and the fact that AI is not going to derail us uh, from, <laughs> <laughs> from, from, from making a positive contribution in the business is, is wonderful. You've you've already uh, you've already alluded to to a few of them. Um, 
I always pose to my guests in closing, and given the incredible experience and wisdom that you have, would you share with our listeners, Chip, three timeless takeaways? Yeah, I'd start by saying, uh, 10 years from now, what will you regret if you don't learn it or do it now? And the reason I say that is because anticipated regret is a form of wisdom. So when I was 56, 57, when I moved to Mexico and started our academy there, um, I asked that question and I said, you know, at 66 or 67, I will regret that I didn't learn Spanish or I will regret that I didn't learn to surf. And so in my mid to later fifties, I started learning Spanish and to surf, which my mindset was like, I'm too old for this. But when I thought about the regret I'd, ha I'd have 10 years from now, it, it gave me a catalyst. So that's number one. Number two is purpose. Let's talk about purpose for a minute. I think there are four pathways to purpose. There's many more than that, but there's four sort of like shortcuts. It's something that excites you or agitates you or makes you curious or something that feels neglected that you were passionate about earlier in your life. One exercise we do at MEA is we say like, what was it you loved doing when you were a kid? And there was this woman, she came in as a litigation attorney and long story short is she didn't want to do that anymore at age 60. And so she ultimately came to, had some memories and some dreams about her grandmother and cooking pies. By the end of the week, she realized her purpose was to become a baker and, and to go to pastry chef school and then buy a building where a bakery was in her neighborhood that it never reopened after COVID. And so that's what she's doing now. So sometimes it's not, it's excite, agitate, curious, but sometimes it's something that's been neglected. Uh, and I, I always like those stories because um, unearthing those is part of what we do at MEA. And then the third thing I would just say as a takeaway is value wisdom. You know, wisdom, what does it mean? Wisdom is the, you know, the metabolized experience that you have that you can share with others. And long story short is, um, I've been doing since age 28, a practice every weekend where I spend 20 to 30 minutes and I say, what were my biggest lessons of the week? And then I say, okay, that was the lesson that was painful. That was a painful lesson. How's it going to serve me in the future? So it's two things. One is what's the lesson? How's it going to serve me? And I have been doing that for 35 years. It's accelerated my wisdom It's ex because I made sense of my life experiences. So last thought, um, on each of the in each of the companies I've been in, uh, Joie de Vivre, Airbnb, and MEA, uh, I have created a quarterly leadership uh, meeting where our senior leaders who regularly meet weekly. On this particular week, we have a ninety minute meeting, and the eight of us uh, go around in a circle, and each person said, "Here's my biggest lesson of the quarter, and here's how it's going to serve me in the future." And by hearing other people's lessons we become wiser. Wisdom is not taught, it's shared. And so being able to hear that and understand it and grok it allows you to say like, oh man, I, I, I'm going to learn from your lesson. And then we actually finish the meeting with a, a, an exercise where we say, what was the biggest team lesson of the quarter? Um, and then we say, like, we argue over what we thought was the biggest team lesson. But what a great experience. And I, it's huge because it allows people to be candid and vulnerable, but show a growth mindset that they're learning and improving. Um, and um, yeah, that's it. I love it. I'm going to borrow that for our next, for our next quarterly team meeting. We meet every quarter to review our objectives and key results in the previous quarter, set them for the quarter ahead. And actually each week we, we on a Monday get together to, in what we call our check-in to calibrate after the weekend. So calibrate for the week ahead, kind of align to the, the priorities, align to our objectives and key results. We actually, amongst the team, we share our gratitudes first thing on a Monday morning, which helps actually build that that emotional connection, creates that uh, that that relational capital amongst the, 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 the team. On a Friday, we all share three wins from the week and one learning. And, yeah. and, and that one learning you're seeing, as you've shared, uh, you know, when you see the learnings from each of the team members, I'm getting, I think I'm getting a little bit wiser as a result of the learnings yeah, from the team I'm members. Sure. <laughs> so it's a wonderful practice. Chip, I absolutely 
have loved the last uh, the, the the last seventy minutes. I'd love to get you back on again because I I felt there's a there's a there's so much we could dive into in any one part of the the conversation today. Uh, is a podcast in its own right. What's next for you? You know what I I love creating the first the world's first midlife wisdom school, um, and so that's what I'm putting my time and attention into. I I think. We're going into an era where there's going to be a growing number of people in midlife in their 40s, 50s, and 60s who are going to go back and say, like, I just need to go. And it's not about retraining or reskilling. It's about reconsidering and re and, and going a little deeper and understanding, like, what is it that I have to offer here? How do I unearth my wisdom? How do I navigate transitions? And how do I cultivate my purpose? Um, and, you know, that's what I'm, that's what's up for me. I'm hugely curious about uh, the the MEA. It's something that it, I'm, I'm going to look it up. I might see you in Baja sometime soon. Maybe we do. Maybe do we, we do a you know a private uh, workshop with your with your community. Um, we'll, that'll be fun. I, 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 we we'll we'll pick up on that afterwards actually yeah, because we yeah. have we have a club our scale x club which is the alumni of the graduates from our program and each year we we've been to japan we've been to um to poland this year to climb mountains in our shorts a la wim hof style all of that good stuff so i'll pick up with you afterwards if people want to find out more about your work and uh, the Modern Elder Academy, where best to find you, Chip? Uh, MEAWisdom.com uh, is the URL and ChipConley.com, C-O-N-L-E-Y. And I have a daily blog um, that's on the uh, MEA web website as well as my own personal website. So uh, check out that, that daily blog. And if you like it, you can just get a free subscription to it and we send you an email every day. Brilliant. Well, look, I want to thank you for your wonderful warmth, your incredible energy, your knowledge, but most of all, your wisdom today. I wish you, you every success with everything you're doing. I've hugely enjoyed the conversation. Once again, folks, if, uh, if you haven't already, please go out and grab a copy of Learning to Love Midlife. And uh, in fact, buy two copies and gift one to someone who is uh, about to enter midlife. They're going to learn a lot from it. Uh, Chip. Take care. Thank you, Brandon.